What up, Fight World? It's your boy Ego, and I'm back with some more boxing. Today is Monday, which means Monday Mail Day, and I thumbed up the questions I'll be answering. And without further ado, let's get into it because I picked a lot of questions. So we'll see what these questions are like. Now, the first question comes from Simple One 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 One. Do you think that Broner and Garcia will fight each other? And if so, when? Would like to hear your thoughts on it. P.S. Keep up the good work. Now, that's a fight I would love to see. I'm not certain that it would happen in 2016, possibly 2017. Broner, if you think about it, his losses came when he moved above 140. And he's fighting Ashley Thea Payne. So, I don't really know if that Thea Payne fight, even though Thea Payne gave Danny Garcia a difficult fight. I think Danny Garcia has grown a lot since he fought Thea Payne. And... They're kind of moving in different directions, you know what I'm saying? Like I said, Broner, his his losses came at above 140 pounds. He even had a tough fight with Pauli Malignaggi, won that via split decision to take Pauli's belt and his girl, if you know what I mean. You know, A.B. So, Danny Garcia just moved up to welterweight, looked good versus Guerrero. I just don't know that they'll meet. The other thing you have to look at is they have the same advisor. However, that fight might be difficult to make since both of them, I, I would feel at this point in their career, would be looking to make a lot of money because they're friends. So to fight a friend, plus they'll both probably think they're the A-side, if you will, based on, uh, you know what I mean, Danny Garcia would be like, oh, I have a good resume. I'm the A-side. Broner would be like, I'm, I'm the one that sells the tickets. So it's a good fight. Don't know that it would happen possibly in 2017, but I would love to see it. Next question is from Canelo Alvarez. Hi, Klaus Born. Are you going to do a UFC 7 Reasons video for the upcoming fight, Dos Anjos versus McGregor? Yes, I planned on it. Excellent fight, excellent card. You even have Holly Holm defending her belt that she got from destroying Ronda Rousey. So I'm looking forward to that, and I'm trying to piece something together with that. Actually, that's such a good fight. I don't know who I'm going to pick at this particular point. Connor is the one moving up in weight. Dos Anjos looked real good in his last fight with Cowboy Cerrone, a rematch. So I will make one. I got to kind of study some tape and see where I want to go exactly with my prediction. Next question is from W Blake 22 Do you think Pauli Malignaggi has what it takes to become a good boxing trainer? Another question. Do you think this guy, Matador Hernandez, thinking thinks he's boxing ego up here trying to answer all the questions? I don't know about that. But um, the Pauli Malignaggi, certainly, he's a boxer, so he has in-ring experience. He's a commentator, and he could put together words, and, and he could say things in analogies and comparisons like oh yeah yeah when, when i fought miguel Cotto, you know what i'm saying he can give you that firsthand experience and put it in perspective for you and he's very eloquent when he breaks down fights that's why i don't i understand paulie malignaggi is on the heat under heat for his same he thinks pacquiao cheated where there's no proof but when he was breaking down the mayweather pacquiao fight it didn't sound like he was breaking it down from a, a I hate Pacquiao perspective. He was intelligently breaking down, giving you facts why he he believes Mayweather would have the advantage. So I definitely think he could be a trainer. He knows a lot of guys. So that's also a lot of resources. You know what I mean? If you need a strength and conditioning coach, things like that. He has a lot of connections in the game. He knows the game and he knows outside of the game too from being a commentator. So I definitely think he could do it. Next question is from Dynamite Kid 100. What the fuck is wrong with Victor Ortiz physically, mentally? You know, I don't really think there's anything physically wrong. I think he's a young, strong kid. I think mentally is his biggest hang up. I don't know if he wants to be a truly, I don't know if he truly wants to be a fighter at this point of his career. I think he might be in love with the stardom and the celebrity more than life as a fighter. You know what I mean? Because this boxing shit is brutal. You know what I mean? It looked like he could have got up versus Colazzo, but he didn't after a long layoff and dancing with the stars. I heard recently he left his new trainer, Joel Diaz, and he's not going to be working with him, even though he won both of his fights with Joel Diaz. He, he, I heard that, from what I've seen, it said basically Joel Diaz was saying he didn't like the environment. There's nothing to do out in Pasadena or wherever they were. It's just a desert and it's kind of dry. All of his friends are in Ventura and other places. So, I mean, that doesn't sound like the mindset of a fighter. Who cares if there's nothing to do? You shouldn't be worried about something to do if you have a training camp anyway. You know what I mean? This is your job. You have to train and be mentally prepared. So to me, Victor Ortiz, if he was able to hone in his skill and connect it with the mind, he could really be a force. You know, he could possibly defeat a prospect like an Earl Spence Jr. And I'm not saying he would beat him, but I'm saying physically, 
athletically, him being a southpaw, him being big, he could do things like that in boxing, possibly, if he was mentally stronger. But, I mean, since he's not mentally stronger, I would never pick him to beat a Keith Thurman or Earl Spence Jr., a guy who's rising up through the ranks because they look mentally more put together. And that's just my opinion. So he has some things to work out mentally, and I don't even know if you can overcome that. You can't. I mean, there's meditation and things you can do to strengthen your mind, but he already has a history of quitting and doing kind of controversial things, saying controversial things. So I just don't think mentally he has the, the mindset to be a dominant champion. That's just my opinion. Next question, Chris Jackson. Ego, who do you think Floyd should fight next if he were to come out of retirement? I would say Danny Garcia because he's undefeated. He's a champion now. The WBC had a belt up for grabs so he can get that belt back if he beats Danny Garcia, which I would project him to beat Danny Garcia. I would say the Porter Thurman winner, that would be a good fight. Kell Brook, somehow, some way, if Amir Khan like, looked good or lost, like maybe even a controversial decision like Edeslandi Lara, maybe a, a Amir Khan fight. It just depends really what happens with Amir Khan's next fight in Canelo. But those are all healthy options, in my opinion, that are realistic. They make business sense. They would make noise for a 50th fight. Next question is from Eric Shipman. Ego, do you think it would be a better move for Bud Crawford to stay at 140 or move up to 147 this year? I I would say stay at 140. If he gets past Lundy, which I expect him to do, I would say there's other fights for him at 140. The biggest fight to me would be a fight with uh, like an Adrian Broner. Don't know if that's realistic, but that would be a hell of a fight if they could work the, the cross promotional things. But you also have guys like Victor Postal, a respected champion. And stylistically, that's a difficult fight. That's a good fight. Two good boxers, two tacticians, two technical guys. And then you also have some kind of decent fights like Ruslan Provotnikov versus a guy or like a like Mauricio Herrera. Those are all good fights too. So I think there's some action at 140 for him before he moves up. But if the right person calls, like if you were going to get the opportunity to fight Pacquiao, Again, if he was in the sweepstakes, then I would definitely say move up and take those types of opportunities because if you beat Pacquiao, you're the man, especially if Pacquiao gets past Bradley in this third fight. And for the fall or winter, they made Pacquiao versus Crawford. I think Bob Aaron really wants to make that Crawford-Pacquiao fight. So we'll see how Pacquiao looks good. But if he looks good and defeats Bradley, then that could be a mega fight. So if it's the right name, I would say move up to 147. If it's not going to be the right name, like a Pacquiao, like a great opportunity, great paycheck for you, then there's no reason to really rush it, and you can make some more noise at 140. That's my opinion. Next question, Ramon Gomez. Hey, Ego, do you ever think Manny Pacquiao will ever fight Mayweather again? I wouldn't rule it out. Again, it's going to be dependent on what happens with Timothy Bradley. If Bradley with Teddy Atlas goes in there and makes Pacquiao look stupid or he wins convincingly, anything like that, then there's not going to really be a need for a Mayweather fight. But if Pacquiao went and blew Bradley out of the water, won without controversy, like he, like the first fight or his fights with Marquez, and it was just straightforward or he knocks Bradley out, then hell yeah, a fight with Mayweather is certainly possible because at the end of the day, money talks. Next question is from Marquise Monroe. Who do you who you want to see Crawford fight assuming he beat Loudmouth Lundy? And I kinda already talked about in this video. Me, Broner, I would love that fight. Two athletic black fighters. Um Broner has two losses. If he beats Lundy, he'll be undefeated still. And I think there would be some trash talking, great buildup. It's just you have to worry about the Cold War and it can that logistically happen. If not, Victor Postal, Herrera, Provotnikov, those are fights I would settle for too. Next question is from Benjamin Franklin. Ego, I don't get why Khan get middleweight title shot when he never even fought in that weight. P.S. Great videos, brother. Keep up the good work. Big fan of you. Now, thank you for that, Ben Franklin, and all your inventions. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's, what it boils down to, in my view, is politics and business. Oscar seen that Khan was desperate for a big fight. He got looked over by Pacquiao. He got looked over by Mayweather. The Kell Brook fight didn't come together for whatever reason. And Oscar De La Hoya kind of exploited that and said, hey, you want a big fight? I got a big fighter. He's arguably the biggest in the game since Mayweather retired. He's the biggest name. 
fight him at 155, meet on our terms. And then Amir Khan being a warrior with heart, he's like, okay, you know what I mean? I'm getting a good paycheck and let's do it. So there's no real reason that the fight is happening other than business sense. It's a weird, unusual pairing with with two names in the sport and they're trying to make money, brand new arena. And HBO is like, okay, we're in. So business, that's boxing business 101. Next question is from Kashad Hall. Three questions, boxing ego. Last question is for TK. It's long, so if you miss it, it could, could you address them in any video you do? Now let's get to it. All right, number one, what's with the myth being spread from Khan's camp around him taking the Canelo fight because no one wanted to fight him? Brooke Thurman, Porter, Spence Jr., and recently Vasquez all said they would be willing to fight him. What are your thoughts? I, I never even heard Khan's camp say that, but I don't think that's true. I think Brooke really wants to fight. Thurman's been on record saying he'll fight him. Porter doesn't seem scared to fight anyone. If you're going to fight a guy like Keith Thurman, why wouldn't you fight Amir Khan? I mean, they're different stylistic matchups, but... We, I think everyone, it's safe to say Thurman is the undefeated one. He's never been knocked out, and he's the more threatening puncher. So I think Porter is about it. Spence Jr., what does he have to lose? You know what I mean? It's a big name. He probably feels he's stronger than, than Khan, and he's undefeated, so he should be confident. Same thing with Vasquez. So I don't really agree with that if that's what's being said. I haven't heard the, the rumor rumbling from Khan's camp saying that, but if that's what they think, I don't agree with it. Because I think there was plenty of fights. Danny Garcia. There's a lot of options for Khan at welterweight. And I don't think those guys were ducking or avoiding him. Next question or part two of your question. Badu Jack versus Chavez Jr. is in the works for April 30th. And a lot of articles are being released to the public about this being a shit fight. And that at a 3-2 to two in his last five Chavez Jr. don't deserve title shot at the WBC 168 title. How is that any different from Sanchez and Loeffler still saying they'd fight, they take Chavez Jr. fight at 168 because it's a big fight, their words? Both fighters would be fighting the same out of shape Chavez Jr. anyway, right? Yeah, you're 100% true. I mean, bottom line, fans, media, boxing writers, YouTube channels, whoever, a lot of people play politics and have agendas and, and pick the side they want to rock with. PBC and Al Heyman, some people and writers feel it's fashionable to bash him. So unless it's a Thurman Porter fight, which you clearly can't say anything bad at, it's not happening at a catch weight. There's a once beaten guy in Porter. There's an undefeated guy in Keith Thurman. So what can you say about that fight? I mean, it's a meaningful fight. It's a fight that should happen at the right time. Scott Frampton, or excuse me, Carl Frampton and Scott Quigg. You can't really say nothing about that fight. That's a good fight all the way around. I'm looking forward to it. So some people have this view that with Al Heyman fights specifically in PBC, if it's that not that type of caliber matchup, then automatically it's a horrendous fight. And that's not the truth because I thought Amir Khan versus Algeria was a complete mismatch. Algeria got bodied by Pacquiao, knocked down six times, and he put on a hell of a performance with new trainer John David Jackson and gave Khan a run for his money. I wasn't really looking forward to Andres Von Farah versus Nathan Cleverly. I'm like, Kovalev destroyed him. What's so great about that? And that turned out to be a fight of the year candidate. Uh, you look at PBC with Michael Seals and Edwin Rodriguez. I didn't even know who Michael Seals was. Turned out to have like round of the year and a fun fight. So realistically, I don't take too much mind and pay attention to a lot of the, the nonsense. Everything's a shit fight. Unless it's a mega fight, it's a shit fight. But you look at Canelo versus Khan, to me, that's a mismatch. That's my personal opinion. That's a mismatch based on the size differential. If Khan was, um, had a better chin and was naturally had been fighting at 155 pounds or something, okay, you can make that. But he, has, he still has stuff to prove at welterweight. So a lot of times it's politics. You look at the belt, like you said, Triple G versus Chavez Jr., they're willing to make that because it's a big fight. Chavez Jr. has a big name. So, of course, a Badu Jack fight, Mayweather Promotions is going to try to make that because Chavez Jr. has his pop's name. That's business, of course. It makes business sense. Chavez Jr. has a new trainer, uh, a famous name in the sport. That's why you see people like Triple G are still willing to fight him. So, I don't think it's a shit fight anyway. Badu Jack, he's still learning. He's been stopped before. Chavez Jr. just recently got stopped. Chavez Jr. usually has a weight advantage over guys. So, I mean, it, I think it could be a scrappy fight. A lot of people base it off of Chavez Jr.'s lack of discipline. But, I mean, 
from far is a different animal. That was at over 170 pounds at a catch weight. And we've seen from far, he hurt Adonis Stevenson. So it is what it is. But Du Jack, he's still on the comeback trail after being stopped. He looked good versus Anthony Durrell, looked good versus George Groves. But you, you like, you, we're not putting, it's not like Badu Jack is on an Andre Ward level where he's just accomplished so much and never been defeated since he was 12 and, and stuff like that. He's still paving his way, which is my point. So how's it a shit fight? You act like, you know, well, not you, but the people who were saying it's a shit fight act like Badu Jack is just this monster that, you know what I mean? He has a stoppage loss on his record. You know what I'm saying? So I don't even think it's that bad of a fight. But again, it boils down to politics. Some people hate Heyman and PBC brand. So if unless it's a, a fight that is irrefutable, like I said, Porter Thurman, then they're going to try to find some way to bag on the fight and that kind of stuff. But this is business. Just like I said earlier, Canelo Khan should not be happening. I even made a Seven Reasons video about it. But it made business sense. It's a fight that's a weird match. So people are going to probably tune into it. I'm going to watch it. I don't think it should happen, but... I'm a boxing fan, so I'm going to watch it. So it's, it's really no different. It's just people pick and choose the fights they want to bag on. You want to talk about things not being fair and, oh, Chavez Jr. doesn't deserve a title. Nonito Donaire got whooped by Guillermo Rigondeau and just fought for Rigondeau's title that, the, that, got, that he got stripped of in his last fight. And now he's fighting again in the Philippines against Zolt something, and people don't even know who he's fighting. So he's doing a title defense at, against a guy we don't even know. So, you know what I mean? They're going to make the fights they want to make, etc. Next question, Julio C. I think Mayweather will indeed come back and fight Danny Garcia. Is Danny Garcia easy work for Mayweather? I like Danny Garcia, but in my opinion, yes. If you look at what Danny Garcia has struggled with, it's guys like Lamont Peterson, he used some movement. Danny Garcia was struggling to keep, um, to try to trap him and like cut off the ring on him. Mayweather's probably the best mover, or better than Lamont Peterson, in my view. Better defense, faster, naturally been fighting at a bigger weight class, things like that. More of a precise sharpshooter in terms of punching ability. Like Mayweather's never been officially knocked down. Peterson got knocked down by Khan, got knocked down and knocked out by Matisse, etc. So I think it'll be extremely hard for Danny Garcia to trap someone as elusive as a Floyd Mayweather. Danny Garcia's only in his second fight at welterweight Mayweather has more experience fighting bigger guys 15 20 pounds bigger you look at Canelo and Danny Garcia their their fighting styles it's not 100% dead on but their their basic DNA and makeup is more similar than it is different in terms of both have slow feet both have power both um do good against guys who are in their wheelhouse who come bring the fight to them both struggle with guys who are agile and move about and Give them different looks athletically. You know what I mean? Look at Canelo Lada, Canelo Mayweather, etc. Look at Danny Garcia Herrera, good jab. Danny Garcia Peterson, that's what he struggles with. If you come and bring the fight to him, Guerrero style, uh, Lucas Matisse style, then he'll probably bang you up. But Mayweather will give you so many different looks. I just don't see how Danny Garcia would win that particular fight. But it's a fight that makes sense. It'll make noise. Two undefeated fighters. My personal opinion, ego. I don't see Danny Garcia being able to pull it off based on his strengths and his weaknesses. He could beat other guys, but I don't think he could beat Mayweather. And it's just, I think Mayweather's too much. I could even picture Mayweather possibly stopping him, but I think the safe bet would be Mayweather decision. Danny Garcia showed a good beard, but people sleep on Mayweather's attributes. He's a sharpshooter, and it could even be like a TKO where he's just like a culmination of accumulation of punches to Danny Garcia where he's just cutting him up. Garcia struggled for two rounds with Amir Khan's speed. Mayweather has speed too and reflex. So I just don't see it really being a, a fight that Danny Garcia can win based on um, what he's looked vulnerable at. Next question is from Jack C 3D. How long have you been a fan of boxing? You seem to know a lot and I view you as a human encyclopedia when it comes to the sport itself. My whole life, thanks to my dad, thanks to my older brother, I've always been a fan of boxing. Got to watch classic fights, sometimes even live and... That's just what I was cultivated in. So I've always been a fan of boxing. And I try to, anything that I do, I try to do the due diligence and, and like really study and respect the sport. And I respect the sweet science and what these guys do when they lace them up. So that's the human encyclopedia because I want to I wanna learn about anything that, I, that I'm passionate about. 
So I want to learn, watch fight, watch tape, study these guys, see who is great. And now you can always learn from the legends, the Roberto Durans, the Sugar Ray Leonard's, the Roy Jones Jr.'s, Tyson's, the Chavez Sr.'s. Study them, watch their old fights, see what they did well, what we're good at, and appreciate all the styles. It's, boxing is a big melting pot. Some people say, oh, you only like sweet science. I don't like just sweet science. I like brawlers. Some of my favorite fighters are styles that go against the, the traditional sweet science, like Maidana, one of my favorite fighters. He's very unorthodox, and it's not like he's just the most technically proficient, and that's just who I am as a fighter. I like variety. Or that's who I am as a fight fan, as I just like variety and, and different things. So I appreciate all the styles. Next question. Roman Gonzalez is coming close to being 49-0. and 0. Why do you think nobody's talking about it? Also, if he beats 49-0, do you put his on par with Mayweather and Maurice, or Marciano's record? Absolutely not. And the reason being, Marciano has good names on his resume. Some, not all of them were like top level. But um, Mayweather, how many current former world champions has he beat? Nothing comparable. I don't care. Me personally, I'm like on my Roger Mayweather. Like, who who he beat? The motherfucker ain't beat nobody. Like, truth be told, I love Roman Gonzalez. I put people on Chuck Latito. Watch my old videos. He follows me on Instagram. Great fighter. Great skill set. I like what he does in there. But I'm realistic. And the, the real fact of the matter is he's in a division that's not really... The most popping. It's not like you have like when Donaire was coming up in the light divisions. You had some names up there. You had Montiel. You had Victor Chinian. You had Abnamades. You had Donaire. You know what I'm saying? You had some people up there that were really making a lot of noise, looking like knockout artists or very skilled and hard to beat, things like that. But Gonzalez is currently in a division where he should clearly be favored to beat most guys. There's um, the Japanese dude. Estrada, those are probably like the best fights out there for Gonzalez. But when I, I don't care about a number, I don't care about 49 and 0, 50 and 0. I care about who you beat. You look at when Canelo fought Floyd Mayweather, his record was almost what Mayweather's was. They were both undefeated. They both had 40 plus wins with no losses. But the difference maker is the names Mayweather had. At that point, he had Oscar De La Hoya, Ricky Hatton, who was undefeated when Mayweather knocked him out, Diego Corrales. He had guys like. Uh, Shane Mosley, he had tons of names on his resume versus Canelo had like Austin Trout. Most of the names that he had that were big at that time were kind of past prime. Carlos Baldemir, Kermit Cintron, Shane Mosley, things like that. And then before that, he was fighting, uh, learning on the job, fighting a bunch of people in Mexico that we've probably never heard of. So I don't care about a number. Roman Chocolatito, Gonzalez is a good fighter, but it's not just merely a number. There was another guy I forgot they were saying he was going to beat Mayweather's record, and he just lost. It got stopped or something. So I don't care about a number. I care about who got you to that number. Who'd you fight? Who'd you beat? And Roman Gonzalez, is he's a good fighter, but he, his division is not stacked, period. Next question, Charles Jackson. Sup, Ego? Laugh out loud. The Pac-Man pulled out the rocket launcher last week with no mercy on them batty boy them. Wow. Question, if Mayweather had made those comments that Pacquiao made, what for you what for you think wow what for you think would have happened to him i think he would have gotten murder death kill laugh out loud yeah i mean we already know that goes without question mayweather is under immense scrutiny partly because of his showboat attitude and what people perceive oh he's a trash talk he wasn't even trash talking pacquiao when the actual fight mate was made and happened but people want to hold like past trash talk against him and say this and that so he would have been crucified we already know that's easy work. The media looks, they, they, they just look for ways to spin things. I remember Mayweather predicted he would beat Pacquiao, and then the headlines read, Mayweather predicts Mayweather Pacquiao will be boring, and that's not what he said at all. So, yeah, they would have definitely flipped it, and like Mayweather's homophobic and all types of stuff. Next question, Lance Ford. Luis Ortiz, Anthony Joshua, who wins and why? Good fight. Both guys got power. I'm picking King Kong Ortiz. I think he's the more fluid, especially at this point. Heavy Cuban amateur background. And I was really impressed what he looked like in the Brian Jennings fight. You look at the middle rounds, Brian Jennings was game as fuck. And he came on, and I seen Luis Ortiz switch gears, start using his legs more. He did a little Muhammad Ali rendition. And he's big. So I'd never seen him do that. He's normally just coming forward and kind of destroying dudes. But the fact that he did that, I think, yeah, he would easily beat Anthony Joshua, especially at this point. Because Anthony Joshua 
He looked solid versus Dillian White. Got rocked, got his bell rung, but he looked more mechanical and more stiff. And I think he would have a problem. You look at that Ortiz Jennings fight. He looked composed. Even when Brian Jennings was winning, I think Brian Jennings won round two. He looked good. He, you know what I mean? Ortiz looked confident. He looked very composed in his style, very comfortable with what he does in there. And that's a um, a credit to that crazy, deep amateur background in the Cuban boxing school. So I think he's just too fluid. Plus, he's a knockout artist. I think that's a guy that's going to be kind of a boogeyman. People aren't going to really want to fight him. Anthony Joshua looked good. If you, you bring the fight to him, but if you box him more, if you use some movement, like I think Ortiz is capable of doing, plus he has that crazy power. You look at Brian Jennings. He's been in there with Mike Perez, who has some power. Been in there with Klitschko. I think Klitschko hurt Jennings in the 12th round. But when he fought Luis Ortiz, look at him in the first round. He looked like he didn't understand that power. Like, damn, this wow, this guy's really got cracks. Like, he, he looked like bewildered a little bit. And that's a testament to Ortiz's power because, like I said, he fought Perez and looked cool. Like, he took his best power shots, didn't look bad. That wasn't Jennings' best fight, but it didn't look like the power was really bothering him. He, he went the distance with Klitschko, and up until that 12th round, it didn't look like the power was just really getting to him. But in that first round with Ortiz, that power was, like, really bothering him from what I've seen. So I think Luis Ortiz is just too seasoned and comfortable with his style. Even though he hasn't fought the biggest names as a pro, I think the amateur background, the heavy amateur background, and the Cuban schooling, just um, agile with power, would um, would get Anthony Joshua right now. Next question is from Victor Quesada. Both Crawford and Hank Lundy like to switch to Southpaw. Do you think they will switch and fight Southpaw at the same time? That's a good question. And I thought about that. I think it's possible because at the end of the game, is about adjustments and jockeying for position. Now, the thing is, Derry John's not the, probably good at switching to Southpaw. So when Terrence Crawford switched, he couldn't. But Hank Lundy actually switches to Southpaw pretty well. He actually said that in an interview. He said, I'm the one that started that, that ambidextrous style. I, I invented it, so to speak. Like, I'm the one that was really doing it and popularizing it. So I think they probably will do that. Because if Terrence Crawford switches to Southpaw, he's having success. Lundy might try to switch too, like, oh, okay, to throw him off and see how Crawford adjusts to him going from orthodox to Southpaw. So I'm looking forward to it. I think this fight could be scrappy. Next question is from Salim Shady. Hey, Ego, what do you think about a potential Lucas Matisse, Herrera, Pablo Cesar Cano fight on the Canelo Khan undercard? Keep up the good work. If I had my choice, I'd pick... Matisse versus Herrera, I like that style matchup better. I haven't really seen much of Pablo Cesar Cano in a while. I think he lost to Shane Mosley out of retirement. Um, I thought he beat Pauli Malignaggi, but got kind of stiffed. But that was some years ago, so he gave Eric Morales a, a good fight. But I haven't, I haven't really, to be honest, I don't even know who he's been fighting in recent years, Pablo Cesar Cano. So I think a better fight would be Matisse Herrera because I at least been able to see all of their fights. I think Cesar Cano might have been fighting in Mexico against like little known competition in recent years. So I don't know what he's even been up to. So I I would prefer personally Lucas Matisse um, versus Mauricio Herrera to see if Herrera can outbox a boxer puncher like Matisse and just really see where Matisse is at after his eye injury and being stopped for the first time. Next question is from Naima Itzham. Hey, Ego, can Khan hurt Canelo to the body considering he's an underrated body puncher, Maidana Colazo Judah? I mean, anything's possible. With the body shot, I know this. I, I talked to several people. You don't even have to be the strongest person to, to hit someone to the body to catch them right. So it's possible. I personally don't think it's likely because I think Canelo carries a lot of mass and he probably got hit to the body versus bigger guys like Angulo or you know what I mean who has that kind of gritty Mexican style and he didn't seem too bothered so maybe Khan can deliver it with speed and like precision but truth be told I haven't really seen Khan really go into the body he is an underrated body puncher career wise but I don't really recall him doing that as much consistently in his recent fights I remember when he was fighting Maidana and Judah and guys like that he was really going to the body, but I, I don't see it happening, but anything's possible. 
And next question again, Julio C has another one. After watching the horrible fights at Bellator 149, is Bellator a joke in comparison to the UFC? Um, I don't know about joke. I think they had some decent fights. That was a horrible fight. The Kimbo fight was horrible. But clearly UFC is dominant in MMA. At one point, I thought the Dada 5000 Kimbo Slice fight was fake in the way they were throwing those punches. I was laughing out loud at the silliness of the fight. What are your thoughts? Terrible fight. Horrible performance that I wouldn't be proud of. Both of them look fatigued. Both of them look like exasperated. Like they clearly had maybe not trained right or weren't in the best shape. I didn't expect that. Kimbo Slice didn't look that bad versus uh, Shamrock in his other fight. So I didn't expect that. With what they were both talking, I'm pretty sure the fight world expected more than the performance that they got. It was just really laughable. It looked like the last punch he threw... Kimbo had no energy. It looked literally like two guys that didn't really professionally fight. It looked like he threw a Hadouken from Street Fighter. And then the guy just, Dada just like ran off and failed. Ran off on the plug twice and, and fell on the canvas. It was just kind of embarrassing, to be honest. Um, next question. Julio Hernandez. Hey, Ego, what do you think of a fight between Cotto versus Laura? I think styles make fights. So how effective do you think Cotto would be versus what Canelo failed to do against Lada cutting off the ring? I think Laura would piece up Cotto. I think Cotto's small. Cotto's a great boxer. Don't know where his head's at in terms of the sport, losing to Canelo, being late in his career. So I don't know how... I'm not going to say he doesn't have heart because I think he showed heart in the, in the Canelo fight, but... He, I, I think he's just frame-wise, height, reach. I think Lara would just, like, bomb on him with lefts. But Cotto's naturally a southpaw himself. He could do pretty pretty well. I just don't. His, his short arms and his jab is, is good, like in the Mayweather fight, but he doesn't always do it consistently. And Lara, I think, has a bigger frame, good mover. I just I see it to be a very, very difficult fight for Cotto at this point of his career, and I would easily favor a lot of to win with um, frustrating Cotto. Like, you look at Daniel Gill. Daniel Gill fought Cotto, and he kind of tried to bang with Cotto and stuff, no homo, things like that. Sergio Martinez clearly had a bum knee, so he wasn't able to move and get off like he wanted to, but Lada, as far as I know, he's healthy and stuff like that. Very difficult fight for Canelo or Cotto at 54. You've seen the problems he gave Canelo. Oh, I forgot to thumb this one up, but this is the other one. Um, next question is from Mustafa Musa. Hey, Eagle, love the channel. Keep it up. A lot of people, including yourself, have Canelo clear favorites, given Khan absolutely no chance of causing an upset. I disagree. Boxing is not about power. Let's look at Khan's locker. I don't know his locker is speed, punch, combination, and footwork. Khan isn't exactly the same boxer we watched against Garcia. Virgil has installed discipline into his style. I think that's instilled, which for me makes him a dangerous opponent to Canelo as Khan is unlikely to engage in a tear up. Personally, I think Khan will lead on points unless he is knocked out and there is no guarantee. Also, in your opinion, Mayweather versus Garcia, a bigger fight. To me, I'm more intrigued to see Khan versus Canelo, as I think Garcia is just too flat-footed for Mayweather. Peace, Mustafa. Uh, second part of your question, I think Canelo Khan is probably the bigger fight because it's an unusual, like I keep saying, it's more of an unusual matchup that people didn't expect. I think people would expect Garcia to lose to Mayweather, given their style, their styles. So I agree with you on that. But I do think if Mayweather Garcia was made for a 50th fight, it would definitely fuck up the numbers for Canelo Khan and lessen them than what they would be because there's a competing card with a high-profile person such as Mayweather. Now, I disagree. I, I, I know what Virgil Hunter is doing with Khan. He's trying to make him more uh, responsible, more defensive, more strategic in his approach. But if you, from my view, what I see is I think Khan was more dangerous. It was a higher risk style that he had, but when he was fighting with Freddie Roach, when he was throwing caution to the wind, I think that made him a harder fighter to beat because he was overwhelming guys. Like he was just all over. He was like tattooing Maidana for some rounds. He was killing Pauli Malinaji because his speed and he just didn't give you a chance to get off. He was just ba 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 ba. Now the problem with that is 
probably doesn't have the best chin or whatever. So if you time him right and catch him, then it could be lights out. But I think that style is naturally what he's been doing most of his life for the since the amateurs when he got the silver medal. I think that's who he is. That's his DNA as a fighter. So to me, what what he's doing with Virgil Hunter makes him. If you're coming, it just makes him. It makes him fight smarter, and you know what I mean. Lessens the chance of him getting knocked out, but he's not as overwhelming because he's not throwing as many punches. Before he used to throw nine, ten punches and all kinds of stuff. Now he's, he's maybe cut that back to three or four punches, and then he's getting out. So it's good, but at the same time, you could still be time with that, and you give people more time to think. So I don't agree. I don't see him beating Canelo. I'll further break it down in my seven reasons video. That's just my opinion. I could be wrong, but I could be right. So I, I think uh, Canelo versus Khan, to me, is a mismatch, and, and the biggest factor is the size. Next question is from 23Doctoro. What is the biggest weakness of Andre Ward? Something that Kovalev can exploit. Um, I think Ward is a complete fighter, to be honest. So I would say the biggest weakness would be the new weight division. Maybe possibly the size. Kovalev has been fighting at, at light heavy. So he can maybe exploit the size. like Depending on how many fights Ward has at 175 to acclimate. He could use his size. And having fought at light heavyweight for longer against Andre Ward... And then maybe the inactivity, the dry spells Andre Wards have with like injuries and stuff like that. You can make him, he's already heavy handed. So Kovalev can make him feel every bit of that inactivity by giving him an uncomfortable pressure that is smart, intelligent pressure. But something Ward is probably not used to dealing with as much, you know what I mean, with the inactivity. If he just basically, if Kovalev takes him, Ward, out of his element, out of his game, and makes Andre Ward fight at a pace that he doesn't want to fight at, that's the biggest thing he can exploit. And he could possibly do that based on Andre Ward's inactivity. All right, I think I have one more question. Last question, Garland Chappelle. Why do you think Steve Kim always hate on PBC? Now, I have no idea. I don't know Steve Kim. I don't talk to him. I've seen him at fights, like at, I think Alvarado Rios 3 in Denver, things like that. I don't know. So I, I don't know much about dude. I know he blocked me because we had some kind of, some situation. I don't even remember. It was so long ago. And he said something crazy to me. And I, I went went in on him back, and then he blocked me. So I, I don't know why he hates on PBC, but just generally speaking, a lot of people hate on PBC. They have ties to other companies. They have agendas. They have different things like that. That's what I've seen with a lot of these writers. And and again, I don't know this dude. I don't care if you guys tell him or whatever. It don't matter. I ain't going to do shit. But um, the thing is, what I've seen with writers in general, a lot of them that are hating on PBC, it's clear cut like favoritism tribalism like they have ties to hbo ties to the competitors who are actually suffering you know what i mean top rank just released five fighters and the, you know what i mean they that's because they have a budget they have a budget in there you know what i mean like certain fighters aren't really doing nothing for them so they released them this is a business and pbc i don't care who says what but pbc has hurt the business of other people like oscar de la Hoya and golden boy like Top Rank and Bob Arum. There's no way you can tell me it hasn't. It's on free TV. There's a gang of matches. A lot of them are good matches or turn out to be good fights, competitive matches, big names. Al Heyman has a crazy stable, and it's hurt the competition. And I think a lot of people don't like that, period. They don't like that. They are not used to the change. They're not used to someone else doing their own way and possibly making their own PBC belts and they're used to the way things were. I I like watching my boxing on HBO boxing with the subscription or I'm used to Oscar's matchmaking because when Heyman was with De La Hoya and there was that partnership with Schaefer and all them dudes was working together, Mayweather promotion, all of them, then you've seen less hatred for Al Heyman. People weren't calling Al Heyman the cancer of boxing because he was tied with De La Hoya. But then when he separated and Schaefer left and Mayweather stopped working with, you know what I mean, like De La Hoya, people start getting tribal and say, oh, man, fuck Heyman, he's killing the sport. But truth be told, here's a fun fact. Oscar De La Hoya and Golden Boy, along with Heyman and whoever else, put together Danny Garcia versus Rod Salka, which was probably the biggest mismatch that particular year. 
But then when Heyman separates himself from Golden Boy, does his own thing, puts together matches like Danny Garcia versus Pauli Malignaggi, Danny Garcia versus Robert Guerrero, people are in the comment section like, oh, hey, Heyman's killing the sport. This is egregious. This is the worst mismatch ever. It Pauli Malignaggi, Danny Garcia moving up after looking suspect versus Lamont Peterson, moving up from 140 to 147 to face a veteran who's been in there with all the names, Kodos, Khans, etc., like Pauli Malignaggi for his first fight at 147 is not a bigger mismatch than Garcia versus Rod Salka, who had to move up, had no punching power, etc., going in against a champion in Danny Garcia. Danny Garcia versus Guerrero, again, a veteran with uh, aggressive style, southpaw, been in there with Mayweather, is not a worse fight than Danny Garcia, Rod Salka. That is probably career-wise, and I say that career-wise, not necessarily there's no one, I'm not saying Rod Salka is the worst opponent, but given where Garcia was, a champion who had defended and beat guys like, allegedly, Mauricio Herrera, beat guys like Lucas Matisse, Zab Judah, there was no business to make that particular fight at that time. So that was probably one of the, the biggest black eyes on Danny Garcia's career that some people still use to this day. That was under the umbrella of Golden Boy and Heyman, right? But now that Heyman doesn't work with Golden Boy, people say, oh, Garcia versus Guerrero is the biggest mismatch, or he's fighting Malinaji. All Heyman does was put together mismatches. But when De La Hoya put together Garcia versus Rod Salka, there was some backlash and stuff, but people weren't calling De La Hoya the cancer of boxing. They were just saying Danny Garcia is a cherry picker, blaming on the fighter. So it goes to show you there's tribalism in boxing. People hate PBC's doing their thing. It's hurting other people's business. That's why you see the lawsuits. That's why you see the hatred. But my advice to you, not you personally, but the people that hate PBC, for your website, don't talk about no PBC fights. Don't talk about Porter Thurman. Don't watch Porter Thurman. Don't watch Carl Frampton and Scott Quigg. Don't watch, uh, you know what I mean? Any fights that has anything to do with PBC and see how your business suffers, just like the competition. And I'm out. Let me know what you guys think, how I did this week, Monday Mail Day, try to get to a lot of questions. Easy work. Drop it in the comment section. Hit that subscribe button, the like button. As always, hate, comment, and subscribe. Till next video is Ego signing off. So if you enjoyed this video and want more content like this on the channel, you can show your appreciation by going to the PayPal donate button or the YouTube support button. And you can donate any amount that you feel is equivalent to the value of this video. Much more to come. Thank you guys for your support. Boxing Ego, the future of boxing.